ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. It's now time for the featured bout of the evening. From the four corners of the world, to the four corners of this ring, the fight starts now! Well, what a week we've had in London. Sunshine from start to finish this week, and the action is scheduled to heat up here at the O2 Arena tonight as well. We are just hours away from main event heavyweight action as Derek Chisora and Kubrat Dulev renew their old rivalry and rematch after six years. Plenty of action on the undercard as well. There is your main event. A box for the European title six years ago. Who will come out victorious? Pulev it was, had his hand raised that night. Can Derek Chisora get his revenge? Plenty of action on the undercard as well. English champion and heavyweight Fabio Wardley takes on Central Area champion Chris Healy. Ramla Ali returns to action in London for the first time in nearly 18 months. Kevin Ajarko makes his 154 pound debut against a tough man in Lukas Maciek and Israel Mazramov and Michel Soro rematch after a controversial ending in their fight in December for a chance to become mandatory challenger to Jamel Charlo. Welcome to Before the Bell, Chris Lloyd here alongside Darren Barker to take you through the first two fights here. At the O2, Yusuf Ibrahim and Francisco Rodriguez will be opening the show very shortly. A four-round uh, super bantamweight and then a heavyweight contest. As big Solomon Dacre's back in action after a really good win last time out over Camille Sokolowski. He's up in against Kevin Espindola from Argentina. And here we are. Welcome, everybody, uh, from the O2 Arena. Uh, last time we worked together, four weeks ago, Joe Cordina produced some absolute heroics in Cardiff. We're, are we going to see anything that exciting tonight? The tall I, order. I, I, I certainly think it would be exciting. That's that's one thing yeah. you're guaranteed with Derek Tazora. He's, he's going to give absolutely everything and he'll leave everything in the ring. It's a tough task. Yeah. Pulev seems fired up. He seems prepared. He seems ready to go. So, yeah, I think we're in for a good night, Chris. Yeah, we certainly are. Six years ago since uh, they last met, Kubrat Pulev seems in relaxed, buoyant mood. And rightly so, Darren, a couple of good performances. He wasn't disgraced against Anthony Joshua. And Jerry Forrest has been a very good fringe world level contender. And he dealt with him easier than anybody out of the last three or four opponents. And those opponents include Zhang Jile and Michael Hunter, too. Would you have Pulev as a slight favourite going into this one? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would. Without a doubt, I think confidence is very high. He's really believing in himself. I think he's rubbishing the, the 41 year old. He's not looking at that or or listening to anybody when they're saying he might be over the hill. And he's a very, very well schooled fighter, Pulim. Great amateur pedigree. Like I say, full of belief at the minute. And uh, he's still got an opportunity to be part of a very, very good he heavyweight division and play his part. And hopefully, who knows, fight for another world title at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Kevin Jarko making his 154 pound debut as well against Lucas Matic, who uh, was in against Anthony Fowler before he moved up to. 160 pounds, actually he was at 160 pounds. Um, tough man matches. Uh, do you think Agyaka can be the first man to, to put a dent in his I said that didn't I? I said to you, I think he, he could be the first one tonight. And I'm just speaking to his coach, Al Smith, and I was just saying to Al, I mean, Agyaka is going to be such a hard man to beat at one force, uh, it, yeah, you know, down the Super Bowl way, yeah. he's going to be uh, an absolute beast. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing him in action. Lots of uh, action to come uh, in between then and the main event as well. A couple of fights coming up on before the bell. Now Yusuf Ibrahim uh, ready to make his ring walk. Uh, but first, his opponent, and I'll hand you over to the man to bring them to the ring. Here's David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the O2 Arena here in London, England for a big night of world-class professional boxing. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn and it's all live on the zone. We begin tonight with a full round contest in the Super Bantamweight division. Set to make his ring walk, please welcome Francisco Rodriguez. And now, entering the arena, please welcome Yusuf Ibrahim. Well, young Yusuf Ibrahim has got himself a platform to showcase his skills. He's a Northampton boy with 44 wins from 80 bouts in the amateurs, managed by Derek Chisora, who he met through his nephew not too long ago. Chisora saw some of his fights, took a liking to him, and you'll see why the, the Nassim Hamed influence is clear in his style, low, fast hands, those exaggerated dips, slips and pulls to get himself out of trouble, and he's not short of confidence either. 
and uh, well in due course we'll find that if he has substance to back up the style the second professional outing for Northampton's young Youssef Ibrahim Ladies and gentlemen, once again, good evening and welcome to the O2 Arena here in London, England. We are live on the zone for a big night of world-class professional boxing. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. We're sponsored by Betfred, FCI Markets, Tom and JD Sports. All of tonight's bouts are sanctioned under the auspices of the British Boxing Board of Control. The steward in charge is Mr. Mick Collier. Introducing your third man in the ring at the sound of the bell from South End scoring referee, Chaz Coakley. And now, ladies and gentlemen, four rounds of boxing scheduled in the Super Bantamweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, he wears the blue trunks with the white trim. He scaled eight stone, nine pounds, one ounce. His professional record, one win, six defeats. That win came by way of knockout. Presentando de Alcafar, Andalusia, España, Francisco Rodriguez. Rodriguez. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears white trunks with black and gold trim. He scaled at already eight stone, eight pounds of one ounce. His young professional record thus far perfect. One fight, one victory. Fighting out of Northampton, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yusuf Ibrahim. Ibrahim. It's a slight delay to the start of proceedings, but thanks for those of you who have stuck with us and welcome to those of you just joining us on Before the Belt, live from the O2 Arena. Chris Lloyd and Darren Barker to take you through the first couple of contests here before a big night of action live on the zone at 7 o'clock. This is uh, Yusuf Ibrahim in the white trunks and the black trim and uh, the man in front of him, Francisco Rodriguez, who, as I mentioned, was uh, out against Joe McGraw last time and he does start fast. Ibrahim himself was in with uh, one of a very good crop of new young journeymen coming through the ranks. Stephen Jackson in his first contest a couple of months ago. And well, you see what we've been talking about all fight week here. That flash, almost arrogant style, hands low, pot shots from, from unusual angles. You said the, the right word on the ring walk, Chris, confident. That's why I took from his debut extremely confident it was impressive like you say he's certainly got that naz sort of style 
likes to jump in. He's got quick hands. You see there, I was just about to say, he does carry his chin higher though. So he's got to get his chin tucked down slightly. He's got good footwork, you can see moving side to side. Nice little spring in his step. When he really does snap the shots out. He does uh, have a lot more success. Can be guilty at time of pushing his shots, but he's uh, certainly enjoying his early stages of his pro career. Good work, Rodriguez. Nice tight guard, not hurt with nothing at all there. Good flashy combinations from Ibrahim. Little switch to yeah. Southpaw momentarily as he just kind of dances backwards. Comes in with those rapid fire combinations and it's almost like the old Ali anti-clockwise dance around the outside of the ring. You can see he's watched his, his favorite fighters and been practicing then moves from, from Naz to Young Shay to Cassius Clay, just rips in a one-two down the middle. Yeah, you can hear in the corner there, CJ shout, shouting to Ibrahim, his coach, get your chin down. And that, that's the only thing, if you're going to box like this, that Naz style, if you like, low guard, and rely on your reactions, it's important. You see there, he's just caught with a, a right hand over the top there. He's got to get that chin tucked down, because as he goes through the levels, through the gears, through the ranks, You'll be in there with guys that know how to find the openings. Rodriguez, even at this stage, it's evident his, his feet are just half a step too slow, but he's catching. Yusuf on the way in there, just ducks out of way of an attack, a little bit of frustration from his opponent. He's trained in the, the corner there, his uncle, CJ Hussain. Just listen in. Confident start by Ibrahim, enjoying himself, moving side to side, flashy combinations. See the left hook followed by the right hand, but Rodriguez wasn't troubled at all. You can see him at the end there, really biting down on his guys, gum shield and trying to come forward. He did land that uh, chopping right hand on a couple of occasions as Ibrahim stepped to him as well. He's got to be careful there, and he obviously trusts his chin, given the way that he boxes. But as he goes up the levels, exactly. he can't be afforded to, to rush into to shots like that as he just hugs his uncle before the start of uh, round number two. Long, long way to go in this young man's apprenticeship. And again, back to centre ring, hands low. Again, just see Rodriguez looking to pull the trigger on that counter the moment that Ibrahim commits. Be interesting to see how Rodriguez approaches the fight from now on. You can see him at the end of the first round, really sort of trying to get himself going. Felt that Ibrahim couldn't hurt him. So will he start marching forward a bit more? You can see him now really putting some more aggression on that front foot, trying to close the gap. But this is good movement from Ibrahim. Really nimble, quick feet, moving side to side. I'd like to see Rodriguez just step across to his right and shut him off because he's, he's been moving pretty much clockwise the majority of the time. Yeah, that right hand over the top, we touched on it before, haven't we, about the, the highest chin of Ibrahim. So as he's pivoting round to his left, Rodriguez throw that right hand, surely he would have some success. At the moment, he's just kind of letting him dance and move around him again, just switches to left hand, it starts back to, to orthodox. A lot of movement, but... Again, this is the, the showcase of his early skills. Will he be able to get away with this kind of stuff against the, the higher level opponents if he moves towards English level, area level? And guys that will take advantage of predictability of movement and the, and the low hands. Well, you know, it reminds you of growing up watching Nassim Hamid, he was he was brilliant and when he was making guys miss, he was often making them spin off balance and he did that with Steven Jackson in his debut, spun him almost through the ropes at one point, but the, the downside is when you do get hit clean, if you don't get out of the way, you do get hit very, very flush indeed. Yeah, and I feel bad making this comparison, but sometimes when he throws those snappy combinations, 
little similar to Amir Khan. I, just, his chin, I knew you were going to say that. Chin comes up yep. and accidents can happen. Yep. The, the difference you mentioned, Nazim Hamid there had this kind of style, but he could really punch, couldn't he, Chris? Mm. And, and create generate power from from pretty much any position, even really out of position by uh, the, the the textbook. Kind of power does Yusuf Ibrahim possess in the hand? Just fizzes the right hand around the side of the guard. Rodriguez fires back at him though, resolute, steadfast, and compact. And now just trying to walk his man down and drag him into. His kind of fight with 20 seconds to go in the second. Ibrahim just measuring the distance with that jab. Skimming left hand across the midsection from Rodriguez. Again, just tries to dip into range. Yep, more of the same. It's just, it's the lack of speed of hand and foot from Rodriguez. Yeah. He's just not able to close the gap and he's falling over the front foot. He's just not, like I say, he just can't get close to him at the minute. He's enjoying himself, he's moving. There's there's a lot to work on, but yeah. there's a lot to work there with. Are plenty, there are plenty of gaps, aren't there, defensively? Even there, you see the left hand coming yeah. back low as he's moving to his left, a, a well-timed overhand right from uh, Frankly, a, a better school opponent yeah. is, is potentially going to put him in some trouble. But as you say, these are early stages of his career. This is where the tightening up phase begins. And you pointed out there, Chris, moving to his left constantly. And that's something as well that you've got to pick up on. You know, he's got to know that he can't be predictable in this sport. So, like I say, a lot to work with, but a lot to work on. But enjoying himself. <laughs> Yeah, certainly relaxed as Rodriguez tries to pile a little bit more pressure on him. And, well, he was finessed in a, in a different sort of way by Joe McGrail, who's uh, very, very similar, not carbon copy, but very, very similar to his brother Peter, for those of you that have watched him as in the early stages of his pro career and, and, of course, the back end of his brilliant amateur career as well. He just kept him turning, but changed direction in ways that Ibrahim hasn't quite done so far, but he's taller, rangier Ibrahim. You can see when he uses that range, when he boxes long, he can make a mockery of these kind of level of opponents without too much of a trouble. Just fires another three-punch combination, keeping Rodriguez on the, the turn. Spanish just lands a left hook there. Yeah, we touched on Nazim Hamid and the power that he carried. And you see Naz, though he did like to move, predominantly he was on the front foot. He used to spend most of his time in the middle of the ring. That's going to be the issue as well, I think, for, for Ibrahim as he goes through the levels. His opponent's just walking him down, walking forward, where he doesn't have that punch power yet. I mean, he is only 21, so still yeah. got some maturing to do. Yeah, of course. But Nazim Hamid had it young, didn't he? And yeah. when he landed these kind of shots that Ibrahim is landing here, opponents fell and they, they didn't tend to get back up especially at this kind of stage of his career again just moving clockwise fires the uppercut through the middle puts the one two behind it and again just measuring holding that gap trying to keep this at range and well Rodriguez has tried to to make it rough and tough when he can he hasn't had too many opportunities which to do it just tries to step in behind a jab but he is he's undersized here and slower of of feet than Ibrahim. Yes, yeah, it's that lack of speed. I think they've they've told him in the corner, I'm pretty sure, to throw that right hand, but he just lacks, like you say, that speed. He's got to catch him when Ibrahim commits, doesn't yeah, he? As exactly. he has, as he did occasionally in the the opening round. He steps in his straight lines, fire that right hand straight down the middle. Nearly caught him there, just doubled up with the right hand there, just gets him pinned in a corner and Ibrahim just ties him up back to centre ring. It's just staying disciplined, staying switched on, he can't afford to do that. Moving forward, you know, got caught with a right hand there with someone who could carry more power. It could be a different outcome, but like I say, he's enjoying himself. You can see the concentration on his on his face, in his eyes, always thinking, always trying to look for that counter, just missing with that left uppercut. Nice one-two in close from Ibrahim. Yeah, you can see Rodriguez there, he is looking to, to try and time that right as Yusuf lets his hands go. That is the right tactic. 
It's going to be a shot in the dark that maybe turns the, the contest on his head because that man there is clearing away three rounds up without too much trouble. And it's, it's exhibition stuff from a young man who, well, we often see nerves creeping in in this early stage of a fighter's career. It's not with him, though. No, absolutely not. He's. Uh, he looks like he's at, at home in the ring. He really, really enjoys. I guess showing off. I mean, this is your time when you get to show off all the hard work, and all the training, and your skill, etc. As you can see here, that's Rodriguez just lacking with that speed to be able to find that right hand, doing the right thing. That that certainly is the shot when you've got your opponent moving constantly to their left. You've been an orthodox fighter, the right hand's the shot, but it just doesn't have the speed to trouble him whatsoever. So into round four, the final round we go. It's one, two sharp combination in and out from Ibrahim, and oh, these are the, the remnants of the crossover between his good amateur schooling and the early stages of the professional trade. Still light on his feet. He will have to start planting those feet in the future. It burns a lot of energy. You know, as you go through the round six, eight, yeah, so what, ten, twelve, you know, still quite high so on his toes. Exactly, yeah. it, it do, really does take a lot out of you. So, I expect, and I, look, I think that will help him slightly, Chris, as well. I think it will generate more power when he's not bouncing around on those toes, plant his feet, and he will certainly get more rotation and power through those hips. You can see what it means to him, though. He really, really wants to to win, doesn't he? He's uh, full of ambition and desire. And, oh, just caught with a right hand and a left hook from Rodriguez there. Yeah, taking him well back on his bike, using the, the full width of the ring. Rodriguez just dipping inside that jab, but unable to make the return count. Trying to put that pressure on him, but just uh, a level below the man in front of him and uh, well, he's chasing shadows again, just uh, a hopeful right hand on the turn more than anything. And well, Ibrahim is starting to see pretty much everything coming on the return now. Yeah, and he's try trying to draw out the lead with a low hand, he's trying to bait Rodriguez into throwing something so he can throw that counter left uppercut, just missing with the right hand over the top of Rodriguez, who moved his head well. But he hasn't been troubled at all, has he, Rodriguez? That's why he's still on the front foot, he's trying to close the gap, but. Right, so just caught him with a nice yeah. right hand on the uh, on the turn there. I think Ibrahim was off balance more than anything, but just something to erase a, a little bit of compla uh, of complacency that just been creeping in the last minute or so. And he was looking a little bit despondent after a couple of those exchanges, Rodriguez. And that clip in the right hand is just sharpening him up a little bit. Just fizzes the right hand into the body there, but he is starting to be marked up under the left eye over the right eye as well. But he's hunting, trying to put the pressure on. Ibrahim as we creep down the last 30 seconds of this final round. Yeah, you can see his uh, mouth wide open. I wouldn't say he's quite gasping for it, but you can see he's been made to, to work a lot on those feet. And like I said, it does take it, take it out of you. But he's enjoyed this. He's had it all his own way. Though Rodriguez comes on, just misses with a short one-two there. Well, and here's the frustration right hold. pouring out of the Spaniard there, just trying to land something on a very slippery customer in front of him who's made him look a little silly at times but it was a good four rounds in the bank yep we just see ibrahim in that last round holding his feet a little bit at that point and he was having some success with the straight one two down the middle there was that right hand followed by the left hook from rodriguez he found his range then sort of timed it as you said when ibrahim let his hands go and then the remainder of the round was you know more of the same as ibrahim on the back foot moving pot shot in not planting those feet but enjoying himself looking smooth looking relaxed and that's another four rounds 
to help his progression moving forward in this game. Yeah, you see the wince there as he landed that jab, that mouse under the uh, the left eye, and need the end swell on that, and uh, a few days to heal. But played his part, tried to track his man down, managed to do it on occasion, but the classier work and the better work was from young Yusuf Ibrahim and uh, David Diamante standing by with the scorecards. Let's head over to him. Ladies and gentlemen, after four rounds here at the O2 Arena, we go to referee Chaz Coakley's scorecard. It reads 40 to 36 for your winner. He's still undefeated from Northampton, Yusuf Ibrahim. The Northampton's Yusuf Ibrahim moves to 2 0 here at the O2 Arena, and he can sit down and watch his manager do battle in our main event a little bit later on live on the zone. Be quite interesting to, to fast forward and see where this young kid is and, and how he's looking in sort of eight or ten fights time. Like I said, Chris, there's a lot to work on, but there's a lot to work with. You know, he's obviously hard working, he enjoys the sport, he loves it, and he's got the quick hands, he's got that desire, he really wants to let his hands go, he wants to work, he wants to be busy. But there are look, he's a young lad, like I say, there's 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 a lot to work on. He's more so defensively, if I'm honest. He's got to get that chin down. He's got to, to be less predictable, but like I say, he's uh, he's one to watch out for. The first fight in the books coming up next, Solomon Dacus and Kevin Espindola. Dacus has been out with uh, a shoulder injury for the last few months after a very good start to his professional campaign last year. Ladies and gentlemen, we're set to go with our next contest. Eight rounds in the heavyweight division. Set to make his ring walk. Please welcome Kevin Nicholas Espindola. Well, Solomon Dacus says he wants to become a, a well-rounded 12-round fighter, and in theory should get some rounds in against this man tonight. Kevin Espindola was out against the, the monstrous Ivan Ditchko in the Argentinian capital just a couple of weeks ago. Went 10 rounds with him. For those of you who've watched Ditch go through his amateur career and the 11 or 12 fights he's had as a pro, you'll know that that's uh, no easy task. He's quite tricky, compact, he's quick, and not particularly easy to, to catch clean because of all of the above. And he's also got good finishing instincts when he does have opponents hurt. That will be easy said than done against Solomon Dakers, of course. But in the unlikely event that he does get a window of opportunity, it could come early, you'll need to capitalise from it, Argentina's Kevin Espindola. And now set to make his ring walk, please welcome the undefeated Solomon, the Real Deal Dakers. Allow me to reintroduce myself, my name is Solomon. Darren, I think it says something about the mark of confidence that Max McCracken has in this man, that they put him in with somebody like Camille Sokolowski in just his third fight. But I think you and I were both very surprised just the ease with which he dealt with the, the man in front of him, given that we now know he had a shoulder injury as well at the time. Very, very impressive. He held the centre of the ring, which I wasn't expecting, and uh, he sort of did exactly as he pleased. He was very confident and well-scored, as we know, and he put that into the fight, he enjoyed himself, and he comfortably, comfortably beat a very dangerous opponent. 
He's targeting perhaps an English title a little bit later on this year, but he's back in action, fully healed shoulder, and ready to roll his fourth professional fight from Birmingham, Solomon Dakers. Ladies and gentlemen, from the O2 Arena, live on the zone, we are set to go with a special heavyweight attraction. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. We're sponsored by Betfred, FCI Markets, Tom, and JD Sports. Introducing your third man of the ring at the sound of the belt from Islington, scoring referee Sean McAvoy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, eight rounds of boxing scheduled in the heavyweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing the red trunks with the black trim. He scaled 18 stone, five pounds. His professional record, seven victories against four defeats. He has two wins coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of San Pedro, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Please welcome Kevin Nicholas Espindola. Espindola. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the red with the silver trim. He scaled it already 16 stone, six pounds at one ounce. His young professional record thus far perfect. Three fights, three victories, one of them coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of the West Midlands, Birmingham, England, ladies and gentlemen, Solomon, the real deal, Dakers. Dakers. Okay, lads, eight round contest, that's a good clean contest. Watch your hands in close. When I say break, it's break clean. Protect yourselves all the time. Touch close. Here we go. Good luck. Solomon Dake is top left of your picture with the uh, the red gloves, the yellow boots. Kevin Espindola, the man in the opposite corner from Buenos Aires. And there's 27 pounds in weight between them. Espindola was 257 pounds at the weigh-in yesterday. Dakers a career heaviest of 230, but he's been doing his strength and conditioning. And at six foot five, starting now, Darren to to look like a fully fledged heavyweight and uh, well not an ounce of fat on him but really filling out into the weight too isn't he he is and uh, that last performance against Sokolowski proved just that he was physically strong when I thought he may get bullied in that contest but I was never in doubt that he would win the contest but I thought Sokolowski would be pushing him back and trying to rough him up a little bit but he didn't allow that and I think that's he's just filling out more he's confident well scored very, very accurate with his shots, quick for a heavyweight. Vespin Dolo, he's, uh, he's solid, he's tough. He's not afraid to let his hands go, especially with the right hand, really does loop it in. And the, the issue here, Chris, may be similar to our opening contest. It may be the lack of hand speed from Espindola that will be his undoing here. That was a nice short right to the body from Espindola. Thank you, just loading up with that uh, right hand. Looking to put a dent in his man early, eight rounds to to do it, remember. But he'll know too, as I mentioned on the, the ring walks, the, the durability of the man in front of him because Ivan Ditchko was in you know, a reputation as being heavy handed at the top end of the amateur international circuit. He's been around for a long time, Ditchko, since the back end of the Anthony Joshua days through to the eras of Joe Joyce, Fraser Clark. I think all three of them have boxed him at, at some point. So an amount of that quality couldn't get him out there in 10 rounds. Dakers will know that he's going to take some softening up and it will take an intelligent uh, approach to do so. Just a left hook from Espindola. As I mentioned, hand speed, pretty good for a small compact man. He can kind of suddenly just burst out, cover the ground pretty quickly and let his hands go. And he has got good finishing instincts as well. It's a nice combination finishing on the jab there from Dakers. Just centre inch, shovels a left hand in off the jab. Yeah, it was good work off that lead left hand. I think I've spotted a shot that would work for Dakers. I think it's the, the uppercut. You can see Espindola crouching down. You see him trying to target the body shots as he does there. So when he's crouching down or bending them knees, Dakin needs to set that lovely sharp right uppercut 
but it's not though the lands a left hook. Yeah, Dacus just lifted up a little bit tall there. Stayed uh, in front of his man at just a fraction too long, and that's all it takes. And at this weight, well, 258 pounds, 57 pounds in front of you. Everybody can whack. Dacus, sharp right hand there, turn right through it to put a punctuation on a composed opening round. And it must be a good feeling if you've been training, as he said he has done for over 18 months with a shoulder injury. He's just not been able to deal with the compound stress that you put your body through day in, day out as part of being a professional boxer. But he says that is now behind him and that will that will elevate his training to a different level too. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to, to do exactly what is required in the gym is so important. Uh, but you see there the nice quick hands, picking the shots really well, touched on, touched on it in the first round there. He's uh, very accurate, sharp heavyweight. Espen Dola never looked troubled at all, was letting his hands go. He was targeting the body with the straight shots. So he's in a fight, Dakers, but I think the uppercut, certainly the shot for Espen Dola where he's shorter, he's crouching down and always looking to throw those straight shots, like I say, to the body. But you see there, he's crafty, he knows how to take the sting out of shots. Two. Often seen Richie Woodall working on that with the uh, the lads up at GB on the pads, just getting them to drop their hands and, and used to that really loose feeling of turning through the shoulders. It looked just like that at the end of that round when he just punched through Espindola with that one two. Espindola just trying to faint Dakers back, give himself a little bit of space and look for openings of his own a smooth calm rhythm the Argentinian and he is looking for dangerous shots of his own this is what Dakers needs just to know that there's danger in front of him and, and stuff coming back as double jab just comes off the arms and then one lands to the body it gives you a bit of a false sense of security Espindola doesn't really do much for a little while then all of a sudden he'll loop in a big right hand or he'll throw a couple of shots to the body you just see him moving he's just Picking his moments. Turns well on the ropes yeah. as well, just keeps the shoulders moving. Lakers, sorry, Chris, looking very composed, relaxed, and you can see sometimes he pokes out some arm shots, and that's almost like a ploy trying to draw out the lead so he can fight back with the second phase attack. Just using that lead hand to just control the head of, of the Argentinian after he punched that time. Just keep things long after he's landed his own work. This kind of distance, it's kind of Baker's contest all night long. Just got to be careful if he stays a little bit too long in front of his man. He's going to catch something heavy, one of those wide hooks, solid thumping jab. And he's a squat, compact, strong man. Lovely left under the elbow just to the, the liver of Espindola there from Solomon Dakers. You see a bit of everything as well as far as movement's concerned. You see how comfortable he is on the back foot as well as the front foot. He manages the distance so well. Really does. Quick feet, like I say, for a heavyweight. Good variation to the left of the body after the one-two. So relaxed, so smooth. Really does get into a rhythm. But like I said in the opening round, Espindola doesn't look phased, doesn't look troubled or bothered at all. So I think that's down to Dakers now to really start going through the gears as the rounds go on. You should, presumably, Darren, as well, you start to go through the gears when you sense the man in front of you. It's, it's just left a little bit out of there that the gears... So you feel someone in front of you fade, that's when you start to, to put your foot down yeah. a little bit. It, it, uh, uh, to some degree, yeah, and sometimes it's down to you to make your opponent tire, and obviously you can do that by working hard and letting your hands go and making your opponent match you for work. Right? That's a good one too. Quick hands again. Really, really sharp. He felt that one, Espindola. Yeah, Espindola hasn't managed to find an exit out of that corner. He's having to dip and roll, try and keep himself safe, and he manages to land something just to get Dacre's attention, and now he gets himself back out of that corner. Is he just backing into the next, though? Good finish to the round from Solomon Dacre's. Well, he, uh, he said he wants to box for the English title, perhaps a little bit later on this year. Fabio Wardy, who we'll see in action a little bit later on, of course, looking to go and move up towards the British title, we think, against Nathan Gorman. And, and there he is, Fabio Wardley. He'll be in action on the main card against uh, Chris Healy, the central area heavyweight champion. He's had a nightmare, Fabio Wardley, getting opponents the last couple of weeks. Had a couple of dropouts, including we had uh, a nearly done deal with Carlos Takam, which would have been excellent. But 
Chris Eady has come in and fair play to him, saved the day on a couple of days' notice. And well, he gave Dav David Adelaide a bit to think about early on in their contest on the Fury White undercard a couple of months ago. What kind of shape is he in? Has he been training? Wardley is a man that's in really, really good shape, as is Solomon Dakers. And I just wonder if in three or four years' time, those two could be meeting perhaps for a world title. This generation of heavyweights is as good as it's been. Joshua Fury, Usyk, White all coming towards their mid-30s now. Deontay Wild, I think 36 years old, maybe 37. Very, very nearly closed the chapter on a brilliant decade of heavyweight boxing. And the young guns now starting to creep through the likes of Bergovic, Tony Yoka, Justice Hooney. Jared Anderson as well, and, and of course Fabio Wardley here. Plenty of, of talent. Daniel Dubois with a good win over Trevor Bryan in the United States two or three weeks ago as well. All to play for for these young guns. Yeah, what a great time to be a young heavyweight. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. They, they generate quite a bit of money as well, didn't they, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> you wish you'd been born a little bit bigger, eh? <laughs> a bit more baby grow in the early years and maybe... <laughs> Can't imagine you as a, as a big heavyweight. I like you as you are. <laughs> Give me a couple of years. Yeah. My metabolism slowing down slightly now. I've hit 40. Oh, listen, Kubrat Pulev's got a year on you, and he's still, he's still doing well. Can he uh, be the first man to stop Derek Chisora in quite a while? So it's still in white. As uh, Dake is just firing that right hand to the body, trying to manoeuvre Espindola around. But wow, there's one of those quick bursts and raids. And as he rushed forwards, the heads came together. Referee. Didn't call break or, or tell them to stop boxing. And so Dakers did the right thing. Stepped on him, protect yourselves at all times. And Espindola knew too that he'd been caught out as Dakers now just putting the hands together. Nice combination, body and head. Holding the distance all the time when Espindola's on the on the ropes. And just again, just slid that right hand counter off the shoulder. Yeah, a little reminder again. Don't get too confident, don't get too cocky, but. He's looking good in this round, Dakers. It's the, you see the movement there, comfortable on the front foot, but as soon as Espindola plants his feet, let's go, let's those hands go, out goes Dakers, not there. I think it's always a, apparent when you're watching at home, you, you tend to see the action, majority part, from, from the waist up. Obviously, watching at ringside, you're seeing the full 360. Dakers, very, very smooth footwork. Not a lot of heavyweights kind of slide in and out the way that nice. he does. And as you mentioned, that, that, that management of, of distance, you can kind of see it here, just the way he isn't smothering his shots. He's seeing things coming back right on cue, just pulls out the way of a, of a left hand. And relaxation and nothing about his demeanour ever looks phased, even when he is caught flush on the odd occasion. And these heavyweights can all punch, but he's got the makings of very, very good young fighter here. And I know he's some way away from his best and he's still growing into his physical prime, but... All signs early, you're looking at that kind of boxes ticked of what you want to see from young fighters. He's ticking quite a few boxes at this he stage. Is. He is, and you, you look at him and you think, you know, how would these opponents, the, the young crop that you mentioned, fare against Akers? And like you say, he doesn't do an awful lot wrong, and he'd be a very difficult man to beat. I think for me watching him, it would be probably pace you know, tempo to yep. try and beat him because he's a very relaxed, laid-back individual and he sometimes carries that into the ring. But there was a clash of heads, wasn't intentional, just taking his feet out. Oh, it was an elbow, sorry, just yep. sort of trying to manage the distance and, and, and fend off Espindola as he come forward. Nothing illegal about that, didn't mean it, but you see in the variation there, that was lovely, the right to the body followed by the left hook. He's got a hard head, Espindola, isn't he? See yes. the way the right hand just bounced off it. Max McCracken, who's worked with the the Afi brothers over the years, doing some work with Rob McCracken as well now too, and they've kind of held the fort for Birmingham boxing. Sam Eggington, of course, an honourable mention to to him too. Some some brilliant fights he's been in over the course of his career. But Solomon Dakers himself wants to bring big fight nights back to his home city in Birmingham. He's going to need the right dance partner. Imagine when he gets towards maybe British and, and European level. And he is uh, 18 months to two and a half years away from that kind of level. 
And of course, he will want to get a move on now. Doesn't want to waste his time with, with Journeyman, wants live opposition. A stiff jab there from Espindola. Yeah, I think when you've got the pedigree like Baker's, there is absolutely no point in fighting too many journeymen. Obviously, you've got to learn your trade and adjust and adapt to pro boxing. But like I say, when you've campaigned at the level he has, I think it can be detrimental to, you, to your career, if anything. He'll, he'll want to be in healthy competition, matches, skills against other top talented fighters. But like, we touched on that last round, an awful lot to like from Dakers. I have to say, though, we've seen a lot of variation and good speed and shot selection. Like I say, I think it's the, the management of distance, the controlling the space of the ring that's been impressed me so much in his first four fights as a professional. Max McCracken in the corner. Not sure if you're picking that up at home too. Just asking Dakers for the looping right hand as Espindola is just stepping across to his left as you see he is there. The blood just above the ear of Espindola. Dakers is just looking for that right hand as the Argentinian's on the turn. He's starting to bring his right foot round a little bit, Dakers, and that's helping him cut the ring down. He's managed to get Espindola into the corner a couple of times, and that's just, like I say, stepping across and pinning his man, trapping him, not allowing him to, to move, as you see here. That's when Dola throwing a right to the body, but looking so relaxed and comfortable and smooth, Dakers. And like I say, you have to take him out of his comfort zone. You have to be busy, you have to work. You can't be loading up because he's got the reactions, as you see there, to avoid shots. So I think it's start low with the body shots, work upstairs, but you've got to be busy. Because at this pace, there's only one winner. Yeah, he did full control here, isn't he? And trying to really put a little bit of spice on these straight long shots as well. See that? Just a little bit of blood just starting to trickle down the side of the, the head of, of Espindola. Something that's landed above his left ear. Won't be troubling him at all, but he's just nodded on a couple of occasions in acknowledgement of the good work that Dakers is starting to land and sit down on. But he's a solid lump of a, of a man, Espindola, and doesn't look deterred by these and when he puts his shots together springs out of range a lot of power he's generating from the legs up and uh, just keeping Dakers honest and mindful of what's coming back at him even though he is in full control through these first four or five rounds yeah head was low looked look, look at a, a little sorry for himself Espindola you can see him in the corner that we're just saying Dakers at the minute but Espindola in the corner Trying to, the trainer's trying to get him going, but it's, I think it's more frustration, if I'm honest, Chris. I can't quite see what caused that cut. Was it a clash of heads or was it another elbow? I'm not sure what calls it. I don't think it's going to cause him any trouble whatsoever. But again, I think that was the best round for Dakers there. Been having it his own way, but it was very smooth, relaxed. Out. Trying to see if there was anything there. Maybe a slight clash of heads. Yeah, Pat, we're hearing it was a, a head clash in, in and amongst it when he was uh, rushing forwards with Dakers. But thankfully not in a place that's going to impede his, his vision or cause him any problems. And again, back to usual proceedings as Dake is just pressing the man in front of him back onto the ropes. He, he just moves off for a second, then goes and takes refuge there once again. Defensively, he's pretty good. He takes he it and rides most of the shots, yeah. and he obviously trusts in, in his chin. He picks his moments to, to come back in these bursts and raids. Unfortunately, when he has caught Dake is clean, hasn't really seemed to have affected him too much, if at all. I like the intent in this round, Chris. It's exactly what I wanted to see from Dakers. He's having it his own way. I'm not sure if he's got a glimpse of Espendola in the corner there, looking a bit dejected and feeling sorry for himself. Now it's down to you to get going. Let them shots go. We've seen everything so far. It's been very impressive, but go through the gears. And we're seeing that at the start of this fifth round. So it'll be interesting to see how Espendola deals with this and if he can have any response at all for Dakers. 
stiff jab again, just pushes the Argentinian back. Esmodola just threatened to step into range. Nice right hand just under the left elbow. If Dacus around the flank, but the Birmingham fighter just responds well. Three punch combination, just letting those hands hang low. A turn through something long and loose and rangy. He's trying to get that lead. Espandola out so he can fight back with the right hand over the top with the left hook. Yeah, just trying to draw him out. He is. And Spindola, I think he wants to fight, but he's also smart. You can tell he knows that if he overcommits, the, the danger that will lay in front of him getting caught clean. Oh, it's when he can sit back and anticipate the shots coming at him. He can ride them, take the sting out of them, muffle the impact on the gloves, rely on that solid, thick neck, good chin. Dakers inches into range, just pulls out the way again of a of a right hand. That was exactly Chris. You know, I've been calling for the uppercut. The right yeah, that's where you throw when you you got Espandola falling over that front foot. Extremely vulnerable for that shot coming up. This is good work again from Dakers. Two to the body, putting his foot on the gas. Yeah, hard shots to the body as well. I mean, Thumps one in there to the solar plexus again with a jab, right hand lead. It's very easy when you're in cru cruise control just to continue doing what you're doing. You know, this sport can get very difficult. So if you're, if you're winning easy, just keep it going and sometimes fight, especially with fighters that have that laid back personality that Dakers does, not to go through the gears. But you're seeing it here in this, this round. He's really gone through the gears a little more. And it's been impressive. A little counter left hook as Espindola ventured towards the centre ring at the end of the round. All right, he's in full control, Solomon Dakers. And as I mentioned at the start of this contest, his plan is to try and get some rounds in and become a well rounded 12 round fighter over the, the championship distance. And uh, this is the way you do it, getting opponents in who give you a little bit of something to think about. Of course, he is having his own way, but he's 4-0. Oh. He, he's kind of supposed to at this stage of his yeah, career. But, uh, if I'm honest, he's doing everything that's asked of him. You know, he he's he's putting his foot on the gas, like I say, he's letting his hands go. He, he's working all sorts of shots, he's moving, he, he's taking a step out. It, it, you know, it's impressive. Well, I suppose you can expect fireworks of a, a different sort a little bit later on, live from the O2 Arena. On the zone around the world, Derek Chisora and Kubrat Pulev rematched six years after they originally met for the European title. Pulev victorious on points that night. Derek Chisora has been a, well, a different animal in recent years, but just shades and signs in the second Parker fight that perhaps his punch resistance is waning. Parker let him off perhaps early on a couple of occasions in that contest, and it turned into a real slugfest. Will Pulev let him off if he has a big moment early in this contest later on tonight? Find out at about half past ten local time here in London, live on the zone. Back to the action here, six of eight rounds underway between Solomon Dakers. And he's back to the screen, just letting his hands go. And Kevin Esmondola just launches a, a speculative left hook and a right hand just round the side there. Yeah, he's just reading the attacks coming back, Dakers, isn't he? You can see. When Espandola sort of puts his head down or he plants his feet, he knows he's going to throw a shot, just takes his feet out and back he comes again, showing good variation, good hand speed. Starting to let them go again, but every time Espandola comes back at him, these are heavy sounding shots from our ringside position. They can just touch him, measure him with that jab, trying to look for that right hand, either down the middle or around the side of the guard as Espandola, that's been his money punch, that whipping, jumping left hook. And he has landed it several times throughout this contest. Dakers, though, has been steadfast and, and in control and had his way in this contest, kept things long. And you have to say, it's been a very clean fight. It hasn't been anything by way of holding, clinching. One accidental clash of, of heads, which has been inconsequential to, to both, really. Apart from that, very clean action through these first six rounds as, again, Dakers backs Espindola into the corner. Yeah, you mentioned there Espindola landed a couple of left hooks and you can see the adjustments that Dakers has made. He just tucked his right hand up and he took that left hand on the glove a few moments ago, just showing us his defensive skills. And yeah, I remember Tony Sims, my coach, always telling me, don't lean back. 
feet. He's quite clever. There's that right uppercut. The shot was called him for. Lands it. Doesn't trouble Espindola, but very accurate, sharp right uppercut. Very pleasing. Yeah, but it was a nice left hook counter from, from Espindola straight off the back of it. After you'd, you'd asked for the uppercut, there it was. And well, he got caught on the counter. And often that's a kind of trigger reflex. But it was a uh, nice work landed by both with 30 seconds to go in this sixth round. Baker's on the front foot again, just measuring that distance, trying to take that half step back with the feet and draw Esmodola onto something. Right hand whip round the side of the guard that time, then to the body. Starting to turn through his shots, is he just sensing the steam of the man in front of him? Starting to dissipate, and is he going to go through the gears? As a result, Esmodola just plods forwards now, parrying those shots, trying to go low and then high and attack. Dakers with something that he won't see coming. But so far, the Birmingham fighter has read most of the attacks from the man in front of him. And, well, the ones he hasn't seen, he's taken well. And often like to see a, a gut check and a, and a chin check for young prospects. And he's, he's had a few in his first two or three fights. And even now, you see, just getting caught tall. You can hear the weight of the shots from ringside, but his chin looks, his chin looks pretty he good. He does. And do you know what? He, he always manages to take the sting out of the shot. And this is the shot. Just, I mean, it, it just sort of grazes the front of the face of Espindola, but that's certainly the shot you can see. He's the shorter man and uh, always crouching down. You can see that guard is slightly looser, certainly the shot, but as you pointed out, firing straight back with a left hook, but like I just mentioned, manages to take this thing out of the shot. <laughs> Mark Seltzer in the corner there, applying the Vaseline. Done every single one of my fights. Yeah, worked with some of the very, very best in the world. Is that, was that me? You and some <laughs> of the very best in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Espindola just turns the, the corner, watches that right hand just slide past the shoulder. Dakers just stepping across him, lands it the second time. He's always got Espindola where he wants him. He's a very physically compact fighter, Espindola, but he's managed with real ease just to put him where he wants, on the ropes, in the corner. And as soon as Espindola, as we just see there, goes to let his hands, let him go. Dakers slides out of range, back to the centre of the ring, starts pushing Espendola back exactly where he wants him. Very, very impressed with the footwork of Dakers. I'll say it once more. It's very impressive. He's sparring with uh, Big Joe Joyce this camp, ahead of uh, him steamrolling Christian Hammer last weekend. That was impressive stuff from the current British. European and, and Commonwealth champion. He's been working on the circuit with uh, Simon Ibekwe as well, who's moving well on the amateur circuit. Based in uh, Redditch, he was Midlands champion in the amateurs last year. See a little foot frame from Dakers, just pushing Espindola back. He's got him in the corner, exactly where he wants him. Espindola starting to show the signs of, of fatigue here. And it hasn't been a brutal pace by, by any means, but Dakers has landed heavy leather. He's been consistent and he's been precise with his work as well. Chopping right hand there as Espindola tried to step in with a jab. Like you pointed out, Chris, though, he is cute with his defence. He knows how to, I won't quite call it survive, but certainly, certainly avoid some of these shots that have come his way. Just hasn't let his hands go enough. He started really well throwing shots to the body, but sort of neglected that. When you've got someone in front of you like Dakers, who does lean back a lot, that target, the body, stays exactly where it is. So you need to start downstairs, work upstairs, but it's just been single shots from Espen uh, Dolo. That's why it's been so easy for Dakers. They only had one shot to avoid. And he is getting fatigued now, Espindola, but the, the left hook is, is still coming back from Dakers and 
because he is letting his hands go. And of course, he's kind of punching down as well. He is a little susceptible to that left hook. Well, opening proceedings on the zone. One of the rising stars, formerly the middleweight division, now of the light middleweight division, Kevin Akiyako making his 154-pound debut. And well, we were waiting to see how he looked on the scales yesterday. And he was dropping uh, another six pounds. It looked very, very well indeed. And well, we saw him a few moments ago just testing out the ring and he looks bullishly strong once again. I'm just shaking my head because I, I just can't imagine being a super welterweight and having to fight a Jarko. Yeah. Like, honestly, he, we see what a beast he was at middle, and I think as long as he can maintain that strength and that power at super well, I, I really mean this. I think it'd be such a tough man to beat, not just domestically, I mean across the, you know, across the pond as well. When he wants to become Ireland's first. Black Irish world champion, Tommy McCarthy still has that ambition as well of course he'll have to recoup and come back after defeat to chris bill and smith and he does want to bring those big knights back to to belfast carl frampton of course has been holding the fort there for so many years and hung them up after a super career last year kind of jarko with the right dance partner potentially put some bums on seats at the odyssey it's in the plan for him and his management team at stn sports and of course for matchroom as well Lucas Macic was, well, we saw how tough he was against Anthony Fowler last time out. Fowler, big, much bigger man than Jarko, heavy-handed as well. And well, Macic, he was hurt on a couple of occasions in that contest, went into his shell in the middle rounds, and he stayed out the 10-round distance. Can Jarko become the first man to stop him? That will open proceedings on the zone. Around about uh, half an hour's time. Right now, Dakers, well, he's got two more minutes to do what he hasn't really been able to do in the last seven, which has put a, a discernible dent in a man yeah. in front of him. And we did suspect that that would be the case, given what Ivan Ditchko was unable to do and just what a force he is. Best part of six foot nine, Ditchko, heavy handed, long levers too. And well, Espindola, fatigued as he is, still showing that. He's got a little bit of danger still to give and, and just warning signs for Dakers if he does switch off. That, that, that's been, the, I guess, the issue for Dakers is there is has been that one shot that's fired back now and again and he really does let it go, Espindola, with real force and, and, and power. And that's kind of stopped Dakers from really mounting a, a sustained attack. I've been impressed with Dakers here, uh, the way he's managed the distance, like I've said time and time again, the shot selection, etc. The, the only thing I could, if I was to be or pick up on something, is it's gone really quiet in the O2 right now. And I think as a heavyweight, you want to really excite the crowd, etc. And look, I, I am being harsh here, but against a different opponent that didn't fire back a, a really big right hand now and again he probably would get the stoppage but i think it's just really being spiteful sitting down on those shots a little bit more and trying to get the, the stoppage but other than that and i'm not even saying that's a negative really i've been impressed with what i've seen from baker there's an awful awful lot to like and you see him now trying to do exactly what i've been asking for just let those shots go in fours and fives and go again that was a nice one two starting with the, the rear hand well, as I said, it's exactly what I'm asking for, but then, as you see, Espindola always firing back with one. Well, he's got a, a rock for a head, Espindola, because, as you said, Dakers is really sat down on these shots in this last minute, and his conditioning has not been in question whatsoever. There's the 10-second clap, but to cap off a really good eight rounds on the return of the Birmingham fighter after getting that shoulder injury sorted out. He's back to winning way, he said, right, Spindola knows he's, he's earned his money here. Not bows his head, Ivan Ditchko and Solomon Dakers in 14 days. And some travel from South America to London as well. Fair play to him. And he just puts his hand aloft and well, he's, he's earned the, he's earned the week off after that, I think. Yeah, that's for sure. And he was crafty. He, uh, he just knew how to nullify the threat and stop Dakers from working. It was just looping in that right hand now and again, just to break up the rhythm of, of Dakers, who, let's get it right, was looking very smooth, confident, and relaxed. And to be honest, I think that's a very, very good. Uh, look, he, I would have liked it, and I'm sure everyone here, including Dakers himself, would have liked to get the stoppage. But I think that's eight valuable rounds. You know, we see a lot. He showed us what 
skill he has, every sort of shot in his artillery, the, the footwork, like I said, was, was very impressive. Very good reactions for a big man, improving all the time, and certainly believe that he's got a, a very good future in this division. Ladies and gentlemen, after eight rounds here at the O2 Arena, we go to referee Mark Bates. The scorecard it reads 80 to 72 for your winner. He's still undefeated, Solomon, the real deal, Dakers. Yeah, really good win for Solomon Dakers. And as I mentioned, we'll see Fabio Wardley in action a little bit later on. Looks as if he'll move up to fight for the British title later on this year. And it looks a sensible stepping stone for Dakers to target the English title. I wonder who that will be against. There are rising crop of, of good novice pros with decent amateur backgrounds in and around in Franklin Ignatius, Jose Stewart, George Fox, of course, after uh, his own defeat to Camille Sokolowski. Um, but, but you would bet against him winning that with, with relative ease and then probably moving on and boxing for the British title in 18 months, something like yeah, that? Yeah, I'd say so. I think, like I say, that was a very good eight rounds when you're looking at the, the English being 10 rounds, I think. He's not far off that at all. Skill-wise, certainly not. He's got that pedigree. He's got that boxing know-how. And like I said, very, very hard man to beat. So the future of uh, Sol Dakers is very exciting, Chris. It certainly is. So two good wins for the home fighters. Yusuf Ibrahim against Francisco Rodriguez from Spain and Solomon Dakers. Completed eight rounds against the very tough Kevin Espindola from Argentina. Both of those victorious. And we'll roll on and sit down and enjoy the action that starts live on the zone in just over 20 minutes' time. Fabio Wardley and Chris Healy, the English champion of heavyweight against the Central Area champion. Even a Jarko in his debut at 154 pounds against the tough pole Lucas Masic the WBA international title at light middleweight and then Ramla Ali returns after about 18 months on the road she competed at the Tokyo Olympics last year was in LA Vegas and New York as well Agustina Rojas returns to the UK for the second time in a few weeks after her first defeat in six contests to Lauren Parker and then the rematch the two of the top 154 pounders in the world in Israel Madrimov and Michelle Soro. It was a ninth round stoppage that occurred about seven or eight seconds after the bell for the end of the round that saw Madrimov victorious in that contest. He was getting a grip on things, but Soro, given the way it ended, well within his rights to lobby for a rematch. They have done it, it has been granted. One of these two will be mandatory for Jamel Charlo at the end of tonight, and that sets the table very nicely indeed for a rematch. Six years in the making, they boxed for the European title last time out. Kubrat Pulev dealt with the threat in front of him. Derek Chisora, though, Darren, he is a, a different fighter to one we've seen. I, I guess stylistically, but a different mentality, a, a, a no, nothing to lose approach to, yeah. to contest. And he was a little bit gun shy against Pulev the, the first time around, but he allowed Pulev to date, dictate proceedings, keep him long, manipulate the head position, and, and throw those long one twos. If he can start fast, come out of the traps, it is high risk, high reward, but that is what Derek Chisora does, isn't it? Yeah, look, we've been talking about it in the build up. Uh, I think it's his approach now, his mentality has changed. It's all about, he doesn't care about money titles, it's just about entertaining the fans and the crowd. And what that's done is it's made him very, very exciting. His, intention every single time he gets in the ring is just to have an all-out war and um, I, what I will say about Derek Chisora and I will say this for Pulev as well at this stage of their career to, to be putting in the work and the, the condition that they're in is very impressive that desire is still there and look the heavyweight division is has always been the marquee division in boxing and look who knows you, boxing's a funny old game. You just don't know what a couple of wins can do for, for your career, even at this stage of it. And certainly for Pulev, his confidence is boosted by a good win over Jerry Forrest last time out. Forrest, of course, has boxed to, a, I think, a split and a majority draw against uh, Michael Hunter and, and Zhang Jilei in uh, two of his last three. And Pulev dealt with him very, very comfortably. It has to be said, he bullied him at, at times. And well, there was no disgrace in, in defeat to Anthony Joshua at the peak of his powers in, in the ninth round. And he certainly looked live there. His hand speed's the same. And well, given how old he is, he, what, what he is today is kind of what he's always been, really. And he's still dangerous. Exactly. And what I find impressive about the Forest victory was the fact that he won comfortably over points. But 
heavyweight boxing, the last thing you lose, lose in boxing is your punch. Yeah. So it'd be quite easy for him to, to knock out Forrest and everyone say, wow, it's amazing. But the fact that he scored him and, and won comfortably, I think it's still impressive at 41. He's still got that footwork, that boxing know-how. Most importantly, that desire. Absolutely. Well, we'll see who has got the most desire out of the pair of them later on tonight. That is the headline on the zone six years after their first one. Who will win the rematch between Derek Chisora and Kuru Rafael live here uh, at the O2 Arena on the zone. All the action starts in 20 minutes' time. So if you haven't downloaded the zone app, make sure you do so. Get buckled in, put the kettle on, and enjoy a night of Saturday night boxing live from London. From Chris Lloyd and Darren Barker, thanks for your company here on Match and Boxing's YouTube channel, and we'll see you on the other side. Take care. We are coming to war. You know, this is why people love watching me. We're coming to fight. July 9th at the O2 Arena.